Hello and welcome to T Academy. In today's lecture, we'll start our discussion on the push-pull converter. In the previous few lectures, we've looked at the buck converter topology in detail, and from today onwards, we are starting our discussion on the push-pull and forward topologies. So, as you can see in the diagram, for these topologies, we have a high-frequency transformer, which means that the output can be isolated from the input and multiple outputs are also possible. So this is a master-slave configuration where we have the master output VM and the control loop is closed around the master output. We also have VS1 and VS2 which are the slave outputs. As we shall see later on, the master output is regulated against changes in both the line as well as the load while the slave outputs are only partially regulated against changes in the load. So let's look at <coughs> the operation of this push-pull converter in a little more detail. So the input DC voltage is applied to the center tap transformer and one end of these half primaries are connected to the transistors Q1 and Q2. The control loop is similar to what we saw for the buck converter if you haven't watched that lecture you can click the link the only difference here is that pulses which are 180 degree out of phase are used to drive q1 and q2 so if this is the pulse driving q2 then the pulse driving q1 will be 180 degree out of phase and we shall see the waveforms in detail shortly so whenever a control signal is given to one of the transistors it means that this transistor will turn on and it will derive the collector terminal to a voltage which is equal to the saturation voltage assuming that these transistors are bipolar junction transistors so this collector terminal will be equal to VCE saturation which is approximately equal to 1 volt and similarly when q2 is turned on then this point also is roughly equal to 1 volt so whenever one of the transistor turns on for instance q1 then a voltage of vdc minus 1 volt is applied to each half primary so let's see what happens when q1 is turned on which means that a square wave voltage of magnitude vdc minus 1 is connected to the half primary since the dotted terminal of the half primary is negative on the secondary side we also have a voltage which is negative on the dotted terminal and positive on the undotted terminal and this voltage which reflects onto the secondary is simply the turns ratio nm divided by np times the square wave voltage on the primary times vdc minus 1 now when the dotted terminal is negative then diode d1 at the bottom will conduct and the voltage that appears at the cathode will be nm over np times vdc minus 1 minus the drop so i can write it here so when q1 is on then the voltage at the voltage at the cathode of D1 is equal to Nm over Np times Vdc minus 1 minus the drop across D1 which let's assume is equal to 0.5 volts. Now let's see what happens when Q2 is turned on. So when Q2 is turned on then a voltage of polarity VDC minus 1 
is applied and this time the dotted terminal of the half primary is positive with respect to the undotted terminal and thus we have on the secondary side of the master winding voltage with this polarity and in this case D1 will be reverse biased but D2 will be forward biased and thus at the cathode of D2 when Q2 is turned on we will again have the same voltage Nm over Np times Vdc minus 1 minus the drop across the diode D2. So we have looked at the voltage at this point so what follows this is an LC filter just like we have in a buck regulator. So whatever voltage appears at this point gets filtered out and then we get the filtered output Vm. So now let's look at the waveforms in a little more detail and try to find out the type of voltage which appears at the cathodes of diode D1 and D2. So let's assume that this is the switching frequency. So this would be one period and two periods. So within a period there will be two pulses triggering transistor Q1 and Q2 respectively. So let's say when the square wave of the switching frequency is at a higher voltage then the transistor Q1 gets a control signal to its base and when there is a transition from high to low then the transistor Q2 gets turned on so the transistor Q2 will get control signal so we need this dead time between Q1 turning on and Q2 turning on because we don't want the case where both of them turn on simultaneously. So in this part Q1 gets turned off and it remains turned off during the dead time and Q2 is also off during the dead time. Q2 is also off here and Q2 remains on till one dead time before the switching frequency has a pulse from low to high. Q2 will remain on till here and then again in the dead time it will become zero and during the time that Q2 is on Q1 remains off and again in this dead time both Q1 and Q2 are off and the cycle repeats in the next period. So these are the pulses which are driving Q1 and Q2 and with this dead time we are ensuring that both of the transistors don't turn on simultaneously. So as you can see in one time period there are two switching pulses one which are actuating transistor Q1 and one which is actuating transistor Q2. So if I were to combine both these control signals then I'll get a waveform like this. So this is the control signal driving both Q1 and Q2. So in this region Q1 is on while in this region Q2 is on and in between both Q1 and Q2 are off and the cycle repeats. So this is the pulse that gets applied to each half primary of magnitude VDC minus 1 and since as you can see there are two pulses 
per period let's say if this is the on period of q1 and this one is the on period of q2 then during one period of this switching frequency there are two on pulses and therefore the voltage that we have at the cathode of d1 and d2 can be written as nm over np times vdc minus 1 minus 0.5 times twice the t on period over the switching period so this is the voltage at cathode of d1 d2 and what follows it is an lc filter and we already saw from my lecture on buck converter that the lc filter averages out this square wave and it would give an average voltage v dc so the design for the inductors l1 and the capacitor c1 proceeds just like we did for the buck converter because the input is quite similar with the only difference that there are two pulses per period instead of the one pulse which we saw for the buck converter so in the next lecture we will analyze this equation in more detail from this equation we will find out how the master output is regulated against changes in the line as well as load and how the slave voltages are only regulated against changes in the line so that's it for today's lecture i hope the basic operation of the push pull converter is now clear to you stay tuned to my channel because there are other lectures coming on this topic see you in the next lecture